Hi there, my name is Eric, and this is part two of chapter three of Photography for Birders and Other Wildlife Enthusiasts. And this was the last slide we looked at. Uh, so another part of uh, the, the light question is flash. Is that something that you can use for taking pictures of birds? The big question is how far will it reach? Uh, the ability to use flash is really dependent upon quite a variety of things. Uh, first of all, is it a built-in flash we're talking about or an external one? A built-in flash has a risk of vignetting. That's where the lens gets in the way of the flash and produces a shadow on the image. Uh, how powerful is it? If it's a built-in flash, it's got a guide number of 40 in feet or 12 in meters. Uh, external units are much more powerful, uh, somewhere between 100 and 150, depending upon uh, the unit that you buy. Uh, what's the aperture value for every uh, two stops, uh, increase or decrease in flash in uh, uh, aperture? You're going to double or half the distance of the flash. Uh, shutter speed is another issue. Uh, electronic shutter. Uh, has some different options than a physical or focal plane shutter has. Uh, and ISO is a big factor as well. When you double ISO, you increase the flash distance by a factor of two. Flash freezes motion because it's so fast. Um, in this particular photograph, you can see that motion is frozen, but there's a little bit of blur in the uh, on the wing and if you look in the feet. Um, what happens if you shoot in an environment where there's lots of light and you're using flash for fill? In other words, you don't need to use flash, but you choose to. Uh, you get a, an exposure based upon the shutter speed, but you also get flash freezing. And if you notice the, the wings of the hummingbird, not only are uh, the, humming the wings blurred, but there's also some detail there. Uh, in a darker environment, there's not enough light to create a standard exposure, so the flash does all of the fill. If nothing is moving, the flash provides all of the light. In this case, there was lots of uh, light, so you didn't need a flash, but the flash does this great job of providing color and contrast and separation from the, from the background. Um, so using a flash is something that you don't have to do, but there is value in it. Um, low light situations, it's, it's nice to have flash. The problem with low light is that if you use faster shutter speeds, then you start to get a, a dark background. And so you have to find a balance between uh, using a slow shutter speed and uh, uh, light background, but then risk of, of motion blur, even with flash. Uh, one of the things that's neat about flash when you use it is you get this thing called a catch light. Uh, the catch light is that gleam in the in the eye that you see. Uh, sometimes you can see other evidence of it as well, plus shadows that show up on occasion. Uh, here's another good example of uh, flash with a slower shutter speed and uh, movement where you get the blur but also the, the sharp edges. I'm quite fond of using flash with lower ISOs if possible. Um, the problem of course then is that flash doesn't go as far. Uh, if you want flash to go further you can bump up your ISO. Uh, even shooting outdoors in a situation like this um, didn't need flash but flash really helped with the color and and uh, just improved detail so much. Uh, again when you use flash low shutter speeds or faster shutter speeds I should say uh, especially in darker environments, you're going to get a, a black background. Filling is a marvelous feature of flash. In this particular situation, uh, the sun is throwing a shadow, which is very hard, and flash fills that, so it's not as harsh as it would be without the flash. There's a couple of different ways you can use flash. Uh, there's uh, um, my favorite way is either on manual or shutter priority. With DSLR cameras, shutter priority is a great way to go. Um, what you do basically is you select your mode uh, setting to, to shutter priority, uh, turn on the flash, put it on or pop it up, and then uh, pick a shutter speed. Now, my recommendation is is you pick the highest shutter speed that you can. And the key here, and this is very important, the key here is you press the shutter down halfway 
and you look either in the viewfinder or in the back display and you look for an exposure bar because what will happen is is that if there is not enough light because your shutter speed is too high it will show you a bar and it'll show you how far underexposed your image is so that will give you an idea if the background is going to be uh, dark or light and you can lower your uh, shutter speed and in, in doing that you're risking movement but you're also going to get a lighter background instead of that, that dark background and that's the nice thing about flash and shutter priority aperture priority you can also use flash uh, it's a great choice with electronic shutter cameras you're going to select aperture priority make sure your flash is on and you're going to rotate the command dial until the aperture is fairly low the problem is, is as the aperture gets smaller the flash has to work harder and you get a lot shorter distance uh, take picture and check the flash if you've got a, a, a Rita on the back of your flash if it's an external unit it will often tell you if the um, flash is if the picture is underexposed uh, usually by giving you a negative exposure value um, you can see here that there are various different distances with the the uh, flash that you're using if the flash is too bright in other words the subject is overexposed uh, this happens sometimes uh, you're going to look for the flash exposure compensation button that's the plus minus with the lightning bolt and you're going to reduce the value sometimes probably more often than not the subject is underexposed from the flash uh, now you can try uh, increasing the uh, exposure compensation for flash but the truth is is that it's probably because there's not enough power and so the way to get around that is to bump up your ISO so when we're talking about exposure compensation for not flash exposure compensation here but this is regular exposure compensation very important the, the mode dial has to be set to program aperture or shutter priority the whole purpose of exposure compensation is it's meant to allow you to change the amount of light coming into the camera for increase or decreasing the exposure typically for birding you're going to find that your uh, subject is going to be underexposed because it's going to be bright at the back so you're going to tend to use exposure compensation and, and bump up uh, the exposure uh, sometimes you've got an EV value which basically is just a number uh, with a not positive or a negative on it uh, and then you would just dial that that value in to figure out what it is that you're doing the common reason why this becomes an issue with birding is because birds are often higher up and so behind them is a, a great deal of uh, sky uh, because the sky is brightly lit and they're not what happens is is that the bird ends up becoming underexposed so if you're using one of the automatic modes semi-automatic modes using exposure compensation is a marvelous way to provide better light uh, you can also use flash but uh, flash distance can be a real problem plus you get branches and stuff in the way and that throws shade uh, which is another thing altogether so you can see all of these photographs that we've got different amounts of, of backlighting um, so quite frankly one of the reasons that I'm not fond of uh, semi-automatic modes <clears throat> when I'm photo photographing birds is because the background changes all the time the amount of light falling on the bird tends to be the same so what happens is is, is they go, go on in a tree and so it's darker then they go on a branch where there's lots of light and so it's lighter and the meter is all over the place but the amount of light falling on them is exactly the same and so because of this uh, what I usually do is I go to manual and I meter for the situation and then I take all my pictures and typically I, uh, it's pretty good manual exposure is a is a really great choice and the big reason has to be has to do with the fact that the light on the bird typically doesn't change unless they go into a, sh a shadow area or the, uh, the there's a uh, cloud that comes over the the Sun but typically it's pretty good holding the camera this is an important consideration I have this little rhyme that I came up with it's hands hands elbow eye with the thumbs toward the sky so in other words when you're using your camera and taking your pictures uh, both hands located on the camera right one on the grip left one on the lens underneath uh, elbows tucked to your side 
uh, camera up to your eye uh, and thumbs pointing towards the sky and in doing that you're going to have uh, the best grip you're going to get on your camera. So this basically just talks about some of the different concepts about how to do this in specific but you've seen the pictures and the little rhyme there all should help you with that. We're going to take a couple of minutes to talk about white balance. White balance has to do with what's going on with the light. Turns out that uh, perfect white light is an equal balance of, of all colors. Uh, the problem is, is that there's a tremendous number of, of colors making up light. Uh, we're talking billions and billions of, of colors and uh, artificial light doesn't have a, a, a full palette of colors uh, and the colors that exist there could be missing uh, particular shades and so you get uh, things like tungsten light, which is very yellow, or mercury vapor light, which are green. Shadows outside, uh, especially on a, on, a, on, a, on a bright, hot day, tend to be very blue. Uh, so you can see some examples here of white balance being off. And uh, to the eye itself, it doesn't look too bad until you compare it with what it should look like, and then you realize that, wow, that's really off. Um, usually what I suggest for people to do is to set their camera to auto white balance and uh, they can do if they want to a custom white balance. Um, my personal favorite choice is to shoot in raw mode and I post correct for white balance. I find that works very effectively. There's a whole number of things that affect white balance. Time of day. So you can see that I've got a, a early morning and a later day uh, impact there. Those have huge factors on life bal life, light balance. Cloud cover or full sun has another big factor on light balance. Shadow, you can see the underneath of the wings, under and outside the wings, okay, which aren't receiving direct light versus the upside that is. Uh, different light balance, flash or no flash, all these things affect white balance significantly. If I'm going to shoot uh, in raw, what I will do is after I've done photographing, I'll take it back and on my computer, I will post process. So you can see on the right hand side that there is a series of sliders that you can control. Uh, in the middle on the right, you see the where it says white balance as shot. Uh, that's what the camera did. And uh, you can see the sliders where they're at. And so one of the things that uh, I will do then is I will post correct and so I will look for an opportunity to change that uh, and so setting white balance here uh, it does alter it and it provides a, a better white balance and so at the end of the day then you end up with uh, a much better photograph and you can compare those two and see uh, the grass is different it's less blue and uh, the red is more true and the gray is a uh, better gray and, and uh, less of a blue gray. Okay, so that's this section on um, my book. If you're interested in, in getting a copy, you can email me and I'll be happy to uh, discuss with you what that's going to look like. Thank you so much for taking the time to see my video.